Who's this? Oh, all right. It's it's your mate, Faz. I've been fun since first day. How the hell did you get my number? Doesn't matter where I got your number from. I, I need you to go Twickers and watch the boys. <sighs> no. No, Faz. I don't want to do that. England suck right now. I'd rather just forget about the World Cup and just play Xbox. Oh, no. Enough of that crap. You've got to go Twickers for king and country, for England, for the green and pastures pleasant. <laughs> Patriotism crap. Alright, I'll f it. Oh, f it. I didn't know what to think coming into this England game. I've been pretty jaded by their performances so far. So, before the game, I thought I'd bring some opinions of someone who's familiar to the channel. Uh, Russell. Russell. England, uh, England are dog <laughs> They're not good. They haven't played well. And they don't really have a whole lot of hopes going into the World Cup. What, are we, what can we take from this game today? Uh, well, hello everybody. Um, it's, it's gonna be interesting to see how they decide to play and what they decide to play after their recent outings. And let's be honest, Steve Borthwick has an extremely difficult job at the moment. Everything that could go wrong seems to be going wrong for, for him and his, uh, and his uh, coaching staff. But with a bit of luck, they might be able to put things right this afternoon or at least get some of the running situation sorted out. So they look a little bit more organized. They look a little bit more forceful and they look a little bit more like they can uh, attack with a rugby ball, which unfortunately up to this point in time hasn't been the case. I've I've kind of been of the thought that the selection of the team seems right today. We're kind of, we've got the best team that I think we can field. However, I think I agree with you that it's kind of like, we're kind of looking for a difference in tactics from what we've seen in the other warm-up games. We want a little bit more of an attacking prowess, something that looks a little bit more intelligent than what we've done with the ball going forward. Um, and I think if we can find that today, then there's some hope. And if we don't, then there's not much hope. Yeah, um, I, th I think you're right. I think we've, they've got to have, or they've got to show some sort of ability to be able to attack, attack in a logical way and play the situation that's on the field, not what's off the field, but what's on it. Yeah, totally. So yeah, Fiji on the other hand, how do you feel about Fiji? Very excited. I think Fiji always a lovely side to watch, especially playing sevens, which I know we're not playing today. But they, they're all uh, lovely footballers. And I think, you know, given half a chance, they, they're very exciting and enjoyable team to watch. And I think we need to remember that this has gone professional. And now people who come to watch and spend their hard-earned money need, you know, need to be entertained. They need to have something that's enjoyable to watch. And by and large, most of the time, Fiji are very enjoyable to watch. Be interesting this afternoon to see if they decide to give England some opportunities to do some attacking, and whether or not they are, they catch them on the rebound. Because you know, in open play, very good at doing. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the main things that I've taken from Fiji is that they have a they have a bit of a weird situation with their team and their players. Is that they're so there's so much raw talent in there, and what they can do is that they have a lot of talents in their team that you can't teach. But it's the stuff that you can teach is what they need to improve. And I think you saw it in the France game. I picked up that a couple of their tries were five meters out and they managed to do the very, very simple like ruck over and forward support play that is, you know, stuff in the tight that they've not really done in the past. So I, I think it's really exciting to be a Fiji fan and 
I might be buying a Fiji shirt at the end of this game and maybe supporting them through the World Cup instead of England. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Beaten, whatever happens from here, and it's been turned over, and it's Caleb Munts who fires it into touch. I'm going home! Clear a path, you mother Clear a path! I'm going home! So, Fiji end up winning their first game against England ever uh, at Twickenham and it was well deserved in my opinion. I think Fiji came to play. I've been a big fan of Fiji since the channel started. One of my most popular videos right at the beginning was talking about the Fijian Drew, which makes up a lot of the Fijian team. In the tight game, they were great today. They were great with the forwards, their scrums were good, lineouts good, everything worked and clicked. Um, Fully deserving of the win, and I think it's really exciting to be a Fiji supporter right now. I said last week that Fiji could be in four years' time where Scotland are now a genuine contender, but there's no reason why they can't be a wild card in this World Cup. They showed some really solid uh, game time decision making. Forward pack uh, was great in all the areas they needed to be. And then the stuff that I haven't mentioned is all the stuff that they were better at than the, the rest of the world. You know, their fitness, their offload games, support play. Semi Randrandra in the centres is, of like, I think maybe one of the best 12s in the world, if not the. Um, so, yeah, great for Fiji. On the other side, being an England fan, keeps getting worse and worse, doesn't it? Being live at the game, you see a lot more. You see where people are positioned and what's going on. And what I saw was that in the first 15 minutes of the game, England looked different. They looked like they were a, a team that was great. They kept possession of the ball. They played with the ball. They wanted to play into the opposition half. Eventually, this pressure ended up with them scoring a try. Uh, it was really great. I noticed once Villa Pona was out of the pack, the pack just felt like it had an extra man with having Ben Earl back there. Uh, much quicker ball. They even they stole a move from Ireland in terms of attacking play where they would have a forward look like they were crashing the ball and then he would pop it out uh, on the outside to a fly half that would put it in the backs, which is a really great move that I've seen Ireland do against England that took them apart. Hey, if they have to steal moves to be competitors, go ahead, do it, you know? But then once the rain came down on the pitch, the game changed completely. And it's understandable that rain falls on the pitch and you probably think, right, now's the time to have a few more kicks, have a few more high balls, put the, uh, the pressure on the opposition to have good possession and hold on to the ball. But it didn't work. And you should have realised that didn't work after the first 10 minutes of doing it. Don't keep doing it. They kept kicking away possession when they didn't need to. They should have played with the ball a little bit more, hold on to possession, Fiji looked like they were strangled within the first 15 minutes because Fiji need the ball to get confidence and get their offload game going and uh, start playing really great attacking rugby. But we kept kicking the ball away and it ended up with Fiji taking enough high balls to have a good counter attacks, build some good phases, gain that confidence in attack. And they've ended up winning the game because of it. And I don't know what else to say, really. The team for England seems like the right players are on the pitch. The pack seems a lot more mobile. It seems like it's there in support much better. But we're just kicking it every single time. I think it's inexcusable to kick the ball within when you're on the opposition 10 metre line and you're kicking it with an up and under. Like, you've just gained, you just gained possession. Let's go, you know, let's get the ball out. A few other things I want to mention. I, I think uh, Theo Dan had a bad game. You know, I, I don't... I don't want to critique the player too much. I think he's got a ton of potential. He's obviously a young guy. He's probably got a big future. But it really, it's really striking for me in selection that why are we picking Jamie George's substitute at Saracens when we've got Harry Thacker at Bristol, who's good, and he's not in the squad? Theo Dan looks like he's out of depth at international level. He struggled with throwing in the lineouts. He got knocked back in tackles. He got run over trying to tackle people. And he knocked it on a couple of times. It just looks like a guy out of his depth. And maybe the selection is a, a wider question for England. Like, it's taken Owen Farrell and Billy Von Apollo getting red cards to have a team where England, you know, look a bit more dangerous than they did before. I don't want to say too dangerous. We're not great. We're not good. But I think anyone could see from the season beforehand that George Ford should be quite step, start, probably starting at 10. Benny Villapolo's probably had it in terms of his speed, uh, in, in terms of doing everything on the pitch that an international player needs to do. 
Um, and it's taken red cards to those selection processes to actually have those players taken off the pitch for people that are younger, more vibrant, more energy, more get-go uh, and going forward. So maybe the selection process in general is just, you know, it needs some work because I, I can't see a reason why a player like Theo Dan is in the team and Harry Thacker has been left at home. Bit of a crazy conspiracy theory idea here. Marcus Smith came on, I think for free, Stuart directly and he went to play at 15. I want to put this out early before anyone else has this idea. It could be that this idea never happens. I look like an idiot, like a crazy loon. But Marcus Smith could be this generation's Matt Gitto. He could play 12. He could play 15. I don't know. I don't think Matt Gitto played 15 that, that often. But having that creativity on your 12 and your 15 channel is, is great, you know? If you've got a fly half that's more kind of... A, I don't want to say kicking because I don't want to promote kicking, but you've got a good fly half that's good with decision-making, good distributor, kicks in the right areas of the field. Maybe having a 12 or a 15 with a bit more inventiveness that can attack the line and uh, make breaks on the outside. And just having Marcus Smith positioned slightly outside of the 10 jersey, um, where he has a bit more space, might be a bit of an ingenious move. However, the problem is, is that I don't think... I think if you're a 10, you probably want to hold on to the 10 shirt as much as possible. I'm not sure that you'd really want to be told to play 12 or 15, especially when you play 10 every week for your club. I think maybe Owen Farrell has that issue uh, in terms of England selection and they probably struggle to put him at 12 because he says, I play 10 for Saris. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a well-deserved uh, win by Fiji who are on the up and up and it's real worrying for England who could get knocked out of the pool stages here. So uh, yeah, that's it really. Last game for England before the World Cup. So we'll see how they do against Argentina in a couple of weeks' time. My prediction right now is I think England are going to lose against Argentina through and through. No, no slight on Fiji. Fiji are a very good team. Argentina are better. So I see no reason to have any confidence that England are going to win their first World Cup game. So, yeah, that's it. As I left London, I couldn't help but think... The one positive in this is that England now have nothing to lose, no expectations, nothing holding them back. No one can think they can do anything in this World Cup, and they're on the easy side of the draw. However, the easy side still has some real teams that are real competitors. Who knows what can happen? Illuminati confirmed.